Good to be here, and I appreciate Brother Valance filling in for me for two weeks in a row. He gave me a little bit of a break, and I appreciate that. This morning, we're going to launch out into the deep and hopefully have a few things to say that pull some things together. Because if you are an observant person, if you are observant, then you are obviously concerned about what you see happening around you. And uh, what I'll try to do today is make some connections. And then when we make the connections, it should uh, show you the agenda that's involved in what's happening. Look at the book of Daniel with me this morning, please. Chapter number 11, verse 38. My Father, I pray now, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray for the anointing upon what's said. I pray, Father, you'd prepare the hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here in Daniel chapter number 11 and verse 38, in his estate shall, be, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Now this was written uh, 2000, about 2,500 years ago, somewhere along in there, 400, and we're looking at something here that uh, even when I was first saved, uh, I thought to myself, now what in the world is this talking about when I first read it? God of forces. What does that mean? I had nothing to relate it to. And if you don't have anything to relate something to, then you really don't have a foundation to move from to make sense of it. Uh, for example, if I talk to a first century Christian about, um, about a jet aircraft, they wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about, right? A telephone or a television, something like that. They have no concept of it. They have nothing to relate it to. This is what you're getting into here, the God of forces. Well, when this young lady was with us the other day from New York who just got saved out of the New Age movement, she said that one of her favorite terms was the force, the force, the force, making reference to a power, spirit power, that is supposed to permeate uh, the spirit world, the force. Now, if you have ever watched Star Wars, uh, I think it's Obi-Wan Jabobi or whatever it is on there. <laughs> uh, he's associated with a force, right? I've never seen it, but this is what I've been told. The force, may the force be with you. Something like that. All right, this is a reference to some kind of an all-pervasive power or spirit. Now, that's important. Because I've told you before that the evolutionist is faced with, an, a, with a dilemma. And that is that on one hand, he's firmly entrenched in his doctrine of evolution. But on the other hand, he cannot specifically refer to what's causing it. What is happening here? Why is this thing evolving into a certain thing? Take a stem cell, for example. A stem cell could become any cell in the body. Once it, becomes any, once it becomes a particular cell, it's called a specified or specific cell, or I forget another term for it. And uh, once it does that, that's where it remains forever. But the stem cell has within its capability becoming anything in the body. This is why there's so much research into stem cells is because they're trying to, uh, to, to create in a laboratory by using stem cells, hearts, muscles, uh, valves, and, and brain tissue, and all kinds of things. That's what stem cell research is about. You see out here, you see stem academies, stem cell or stem academies, they call them. And that's simply a reference to the fact that here we are, we are taking young minds and we are teaching these young minds and we're preparing them so that they can develop uh, into whatever that uh, their gifts are and, and they've been put on this earth to do. That's all fine, well, and good. But we need to understand that there is a design going on. There is no way in the world that what's happening around you in this universe that you're part of is an accident. No way. There is a design, and this is where the argument comes in, because when you get into the public school systems, tell them, well, why don't you teach alongside evolution the fact that maybe something designed this? And they'll say, well, immediately you're trying to bring religion into it. You didn't say anything about religion. Simply said design. And design is a fact of life. 
So this force that we're talking about is a very powerful, all-pervasive thing, but we need to define it and understand it. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Now, you've heard me mention to you about a lady named Linda Kimball. How many remember me telling you about her? This is a very, very, very smart woman. And I've read a lot of her material. And uh, just a few days ago, after I got back from vacation, she had published a new article. And the article was about uh, uh, the hideous, that hideous strength, demonic outpouring, and unconscious Satanism. And I'm going to use a lot of her material this morning because I was amazed as I read through her stuff at how much of what she says agrees exactly with what I've been trying to teach you. It always makes you feel good to know that uh, you're not way out here on a limb by yourself. <laughs> you ever get that feeling? I don't like to be out there by myself. And as I've told you before, if you do not use another man or a woman's brain, it's a good indication you have none of your own. Think on that. And so I'm going to use this lady's knowledge because she's very good in, uh, in this area. Now let's start off with what she says. Here I'm going to go down into her article and I'm going to start reading where she says, Hindus call our earth Brahma or God. For they, now I'm quoting, this is a quotation. She, this is not in her agreement. I'll give you the context. She's quoting Robert Mueller. He lived from 1923 to 2010. He was the former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, architect of World Core Curriculum, hailed as the UN's prophet of hope in shaping a, quote, global spirituality. Now, digest that for a moment. Global spirituality. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this is one of the movers and shakers behind a one world religion. That's what it tells you right off the bat. All right, we're quoting him. Hindus call our earth Brahma or God, for they rightly see no difference between our earth and the divine. This ancient sim simple truth is slowly dawning again upon humanity. It's full flowering, be the real, great new story of humanity as we are about to enter our cosmic age. Now that's a big deal. We're entering our cosmic age, he says. What was it they sang? The group called Hare? The age of what? Aquarius, the water bearer. The roots of evolution, now Mrs. Kimball tells us, the roots of evolution stretch back to Mesopotamia, the city of Babylon. In its modern version, evolution describes the progress of a divine spark or energy as it inhabits in succession the bodies of different beings over the course of millions and billions of years. In words, in the words of emergent church leader Rob Bell, this is a professing Christian church. He says, evolution is an energy in the world and electricity that everything is plugged into, quote, the Greeks call it zoe. This is where we get the word zoo. That means life. The Greeks call it zoe. The mystics call it spirit. Obi-Wan called it the force. This energy, spark, and electricity that pulses through all creation sustains it, fuels it, Keeps it growing, growing, evolving, reproducing. Quoted from Love Wins, page, page 144. Now what do we got? We've got this emerging church leader saying that evolution is a fact and that there is a, he can't define it. He uses so many different words. That means that there's no definite definition of it, but it's some kind of a spirit, electricity, force. There's something moving out here that is designing and sustaining and bringing into existence everything you know. Now, of course, if you're a Christian, it's God. All things were made by him and for him, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. If you're a Christian, the Bible has a clear answer as to what is going on out here in the creation. It's God. He's the designer and sustainer of the universe. 
But of course, if you're not, then you have to, if you're smart, and these people are smart, and you've rejected the Bible, and you've refused to believe that God personally is doing this. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus, Colossians 1, the Jehovah, the Old Testament. You refuse to believe that, so when you refuse the, when you reject the Bible, then you have to turn to another source. And of course, once you reject the Bible, every other source is darkness, ignorance, superstition, and the like. There's nothing left because the Bible is the source of absolute truth. All right, so these people, in order to bolster their doctrine of evolution, are saying that there's got to be something working out here that's at work. And as before I mentioned to you, I told you how that is some of them refer to it as a universal life force. Now, just think for a moment. Wouldn't it be something then in their way of thinking? If we have this electricity, this power, this force, this spirit that's moving in all creation, then we need to plug into it, right? That's exactly what they think. That's the way they operate. That's what animates their mind. We need to plug in to that spirit, that force, so forth and so on. And that's what leads us to the next that Miss Kimball brings for us. Initiates and adepts like Robert Mueller, evolution magically transforms man into God. Now remember, we get into semantics here. When they say God and I say God, we're talking about two entirely different things. When I say God, I'm talking about that one eternal, invisible, almighty, everlasting being that manifested himself 2,000 years ago in the flesh as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God. And there are no other gods. There are no other gods. None. He said in the book of Isaiah, he thundered to Isaiah and said, I know not any. <laughs> there are no other. I'm it and that's it. <laughs> and there is. He's the only one. But... They use the same terminology sometimes, especially New Agers. You've got to watch them. A New Ager will use the same terminology that you use as a Christian, but they are talking about an entirely different thing. You've got to keep that in mind. So you've got to be able to look through what they're saying and look at the basis of what they're talking about and the foundation of it. That's discernment. You've got to be awful careful, especially today because there's so much of it out there. Here we go. The evolution of man into Superman was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries and the real purpose of modern and, she sa he says, masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the expediting of the spiritual evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into a more godlike quality and this is a definite science, a royal art, which is possible for each of us to put into practice. Quoting the meaning of mason masonry, W.L. Wilmhurst, page 47. Now, this is what this man said about this. This is not going to be about masonry. That's simply, <coughs> that's simply a peripheral thing that has to do with this universal life force, this architect of the universe, all of this stuff. Let's go back to the heart, to the to the to the to the heart and core of what we're talking about. Within the context of this royal occult science, all being God, man, universe is at the bottom one, or monistic, making it possible while under direction of demons for the mind of man to fuse with God. Beneath the idea of man's fusion with the divine energy field is the ancient Egyptian hermetic principle of the correlation of the divine energy field with the mind of man as above, so below. So the Ouroboros, the snake in the circle that is a hold of its tail. Continue. Hermes Trismegistus is the father of the magic tradition. His world-famous magic formula demonstrates the consubstantiality, oneness of Hermes' divine mind with the energy field or one substance above. In teaching the meaning of the formula to his son, Tat, he said, quote, now listen carefully, the intellect, O Tat, is drawn from the very substance of God. In men, this intellect is God. Let that settle in. 
And so some men are gods and their humanity is near to divinity. If man makes right use of God's gifts, he differs in no way from the immortals. This is a quotation of God and the Knowledge of Reality, Thomas Molnar, page 78. What did he say? He said that if you can connect with a divine spark within, you can, you can become conscious of your godhood. And some men and women have more of that divine spark within. So therefore, they are above us when they walk among us. They are already part of the immortals. That's what he's saying. He's saying that in the process of evolution that we've been talking about from the beginning. How many of you believe that, that, that evolution is... I don't know how to ask this question. I doubt if any of you believe in evolution. Hope not. But if you are a believer in evolution, do you think it stopped? Or is it continuing? Here's the point. What's on down the road? What was the point to begin with? What's the purpose in all of this? All right. To these people, the point and purpose of evolution is that you will become God and plug into this universal life force which, of course, this is exactly what Plato taught. He taught this hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the golden age of Greece, one of the great philosophers of the Greek philosophy. Plato taught a system of evolution, a system of evolution. And we call it monism. We call it this plugging in to this universal spirit and life force. But here's the sinister aspect of it. These people really believe that from their ranks one will rise who has become God. Is there anything in the Bible that would tell you and warn you about someone rising from the ranks of a man or mankind who is worshipped as God? The beast of Revelation 13, the Antichrist. He's a pseudo-Christos. He's set in contradistinction to the true Christ. He is anti-Christ. He's against Christ, but he's also anti-Christ in the sense that here's the true Christ, here's the false Christ. Compare them. They're not the same. This is why in Revelation chapter number 6, a rider on a white horse shows up. Revelation chapter 19, a rider on a white horse shows up. You have two riders on white horses in the book of Revelation. The rider of the white horse, Revelation chapter number 6, is different from the one in Revelation 19. You compare the two. The one in Revelation chapter number 19 comes as a man of war and blood flowing as high as a horse's bridle. And he has a name on his vesture written that no man knows except God and his name is called the Word of God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Nothing like that is said about the rider of the white horse in Revelation 6. Why? Because the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter number 6 is an imitation Christ, a false Christ, a pseudo-Christ. He's an antichrist. And this is where you get in Revelation 6 the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Most people in the country have heard of that, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But this rider in Revelation chapter number 6 is the antichrist. But he is not the true Christ. So this God-man that rises from the ranks of humanity will be readily accepted by the people on earth because he is part of their belief system. He's part of everything they believe. He is the consummation of all they believe. It will make them all feel better to know he reached it, he attained it, he's there now, and we can too. And that will be his message to humanity. That salvation does not come through the blood of one who died on a cross 2,000 years ago and there that blood washes your sins away. Salvation comes by a constant, if necessary, reincarnation working out of karma where you're lifted higher and higher and higher as an initiate into the initiate religions and one day all of this will flood into your soul and you'll connect yourself with the divine and realize the God hood in you and from that springboard you can move right on in to divinity 
And that's what, uh, according to them, that we are here for. What are we here for? We're here for a test. We're here to learn the love of God. We're here to have fellowship with our Creator. And when he went to a cross 2,000 years ago and died and paid the sin debt for our sins, it was that he redeemed us from condemnation and from the fall of Adam and that one day we will be able to fellowship and commune with him and no angel will ever be able to do what you will be able to do. That's what he made you for, that one day you will be able to enjoy God as God enjoys you. And that will be something. But you will never, ever, ever, regardless of how long, God gives you life into eternity. You will never, ever, ever become God. But have you ever seen a bumper sticker that says, I am God? They used to, play, they used to, to prominently display them uh, a couple of decades ago. You saw them everywhere. The New Age movement goes in cycles, and it had had a resurgence, and all of a sudden everybody was God. You remember when they, when they, when they uh, I forget who it was, it came out and said, God is dead. All right. You know why he said God is dead? He was saying that the, he, said, he was saying that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, or, the God of Western cultural civilization, the Abrahamic God, that God is dead. Now let me introduce you to a new God. And that's what that was all about. How many of you follow me here this morning? Do you see any of this happening around you? Is any of this relevant for now? Sure it is. Absolutely. I got a thing from a, uh, a believer over in the United Kingdom. I get a lot of stuff from England. And uh, this lady sent me this the other day. And she cut this out of a, uh, of a magazine, apparently, that, that, uh, that moves around in England. And here's a, here's a picture of a witch. See the witch in the moon? All right. And you say, well, boy, that's, that's backward out in the woods for ignorant people. Oh, no, 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 no. These are highly educated uh, millennials, a lot of them, uh, uh, female, female, feminine, that have, uh, they have found out, many of them already, that in order to get ahead, they need a little, uh, little help. And they've learned that by plugging into some spiritual power that they can get ahead. And so they're, they're, they're dabbling with, uh, with uh, witchcraft. You remember the 21st day of June just passed, didn't it? That's the summer solstice. The word solstice is a Latin word. I looked it up one time. I thought, now, why do they use the word solstice with summer solstice? So I looked it up. That, word, that Latin word means to retreat. It means to go back. So what that means is the longest day of the year is the first day of the retreat. The sun begins to go back, right? Okay. The summer solstice is very important to the occult world. <clears throat> they met at, at uh, Stonehenge. I told you I've been to Stonehenge. been there one time. It's quite a remarkable place. They still don't know exactly what Stonehenge is about. Don't let anybody flim-flam you. A lot of people think they've got it all figured out, and they don't. But anyway... The occult world makes a big deal about Stonehenge, and it draws people by the thousands. They make a big deal about the summer solstice. That you can find tombs, archaeological discoveries all over the world, where on the on the 21st day of June, the sun is in a certain position, and the rays of the sun will come through a hole that is cut in that tomb or that temple or whatever it is, and it will shine right down on a certain spot. That's how important it was to these people, all right? But how many of you know our famous atheist? What's his name? Hawk, uh, Dawkins? Dawkins? Hawk, Stephen Hawking. Yeah, there was one called Do Richard Dawking. Dawking is one. And uh, But anyway... You know, they come along, they're preaching this stuff about atheism. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. The biggest fool ever walked the face of the earth talks about something he can't prove. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. The Bible said, the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. But did you notice? Men are not becoming atheist. Men are becoming more religious. It is the religion, the pagan religion. It is this occult world. Materialism, dialectic materialism, 
is never will never satisfy the human soul. You are a spirit being and you will never, ever be satisfied and complete in your being until you plug into a spirit. The problem is you plug into the wrong spirit and you get messed up big time. You plug into the right spirit and you're born again and you're satisfied. You have a meaning. You, there's something that just complete about you that wasn't complete about you before. They like to deny that, but you can't deny that. That's what they call an existential proof. It is there. It exists. You can't deny it, so you've got to accept it. So they say there is no God, but the problem is they're running now. They're growing by leaps and bounds. You've got these women into, 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 into witchcraft, Satanism, all this other stuff, and the reason they are is because they're, at this time, 2017, people are more interested in the occult, the spirit world, demons, and all of this other stuff than I can remember in my lifetime. So there's got to be a reason for it. Nothing happens per chance. Nothing happens. It just happens. And when it happens, there's a reason for it happening when it happens. So the God-man, the God-man arises from their ranks, and we know who he is. How does he arise from their ranks? He, ri he rises from their ranks because he has plugged in to this universal life force, this Brahma, this spirit, this monism, whatever you want to call it. Everybody's got their own spin on it, but they're talking about the same thing. They're talking about the same thing. They're plugged into it, and he rises above the ranks. And then in Revelation chapter number 13, he as God sitteth in the temple of God, professing to be God, right? Yeah. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw a bumper sticker. I told you about this a few years ago. It hadn't been long. And on the bumper sticker in front of me, I read, he said, I am God. I thought to myself, let me tell you something, son. You don't have to tell anybody when you're God. <laughs> You let that almighty being show up. You don't have to tell anybody. When the Lord Jesus appears in Revelation 19, he doesn't have to say, I am God. They'll know. And they'll tremble. He doesn't have to tell you. He doesn't have to tell you. If God ever touches your life, he ever really touches your life, you will know it. <laughs> and you'll never be the same again. Even if you never get saved, once that almighty being touches you and brings real conviction upon you, from that day forward, you're never the same again. Never the same. Never the same. How could such a one as that touch you and you not know it? <laughs> no, 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 no. God almighty. <laughs> Amen. But listen to this now. Watch the way this woman puts this together because she's going to come with a summation here in a minute. I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to have to move on. From the time of Babylon, men have employed a variety of occult psychotechnologies and substances such as consciousness-altering drugs, hypnosis, yogic trance, transcendental meditation, ecstatic, drug, ecstatic drank, dance, rather, drumming, and in our own age, heavy metal rock music, especially in combination with drugs, the Silva method, deep breathing exercises, and electronic dance music in the quest, watch this, to become one with the light or energy field above. So they're trying to connect with it. They're trying to connect. Now listen to what this man says. I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe, thereby to my deepest pantheistic aspirations. I'm glad he's honest about it because that is pure pantheism. It was especially the image of God which Teilhard saw in need of urgent redefinition. I'll bet. Modern man has not yet found the God he can adore, a God commensurate to the newly discovered dimensions of the universe. This is Ursula King towards a new mysticism, Teilhard D. Uh, uh, Chardon and Eastern Religions, page 172. Now watch this. Our increasingly satanic age of subjectivism, 
spreading apostasy, spiritism, global pedophile rings, and other unspeakable evils is witnessing an explosive revival of this ancient occult phenomena. And it is. The floodgates have been opened. You are being saturated with demons. A major reason that psychology allegedly provides us with a scientific explanation that ascribes whatever frightening entities encountered while on drugs or through techniques such as taught in the Silva method to archetypal images from the collective unconscious, a theory attributed to the demonically influenced Carl Jung. Let me put that in other words. When people get into this drug-induced trance, they begin to experience things that blow their mind. They come in contact with spirits. They can't explain it. And it literally shakes them up. What this man is saying is that this is all part of your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is part of where you came from. You are a product of the universal life force. Remember, you have evolved. What you're, going, what you're saying is you're going back to your roots. You're going back to where you came from, what you're about. And by doing that, it scares you, but it builds an appetite. Watch how this thing goes. Young's theory, however, was preceded by William James, 1842-1910, theory of religious experience, referred to as the father of American psychology. James theorized that religious experience is a manifestation of the subconscious, the means by which man communicates with God within. That's what I just said a moment ago. See that? That's exactly what I said a moment ago. The theories of James are examples of unconscious Satanism as René Gaillon, 1886-1951, the French metaphysician of perennial philosophy, explains in The Spiritist Fallacy, a detailed expose of the Theosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, Spiritism, and evolutionary thinking overtaking the minds of Western modernist priests and intellectuals during Gaillon's lifetime. Guyon, a man very knowledgeable about the ancient mystery, spiritism, and the occult, described sophisticated Western theologians and like-minded intellectuals as those who cannot speak of the devil. Now watch this. Without a smile of disdain or an even more contemptuous shrug of the shoulders, their contempt is due to the fact that scientifically enlightened modernists bought into the lie that Lucifer is not the devil, but rather the light bearer. They even go so far as to call him the great creative intelligence. Thus they invoke Lucifer and perform his cult, but in fact these people, so forth and so on. Now you're getting a hold of this. This universal life force that you evolved from, that you connect back to in your subconscious when you're in drugs or in a static state, that universal life force has a master, and that master is Lucifer. Lucifer becomes your God. Lucifer becomes the source of your being. Lucifer becomes the object of your worship. Lucifer becomes the one true living God, as they define God, to every occultist and to the modern mind. They don't believe in a devil. A devil is an is a antiquated, superstitious idea. They don't believe in the devil, but they certainly believe in Lucifer. This is why the new Bible dictionaries, some of them, not all of them, but some of the new Bible dictionaries are confusing the identity of Lucifer with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it as clear as it possibly can. There is a vast difference between Lucifer and the Lord Jesus Christ. Vast difference. Vast difference. They are not the same. 
uh, Annie Besant and uh, the other that started the Theos Theosophic Society late 1800s, early 1900s, when they st first started publishing the material, they called it the Lucis Trust, Lucifer's Trust. They, they, along with many other, let me tell you something. This is quick. This is a very quick thing. Quick. You take the name Lucifer, type it into what somebody's talking about, and I'll tell you just that fast at where they're coming from and what they believe. Albert Pike, Albert Pike, the Grand Dragon of the Masonic Lodge, Albert Pike made it very clear Lucifer was his god. Not Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. They would come to the word Jehovah, they'd say Adonai. Not Adonai, according to him, but Lucifer. All right. Ever right to believe that? Fine, Mr. Pike. That's what you believe? Fine. I believe he knows better now. Amen. I do. And, you know, I take no, I don't gloat in that. It's sad when any soul leaves this world ignorant of God. It really is. But the bottom line is, I don't worship Lucifer. I worship the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. But notice how Satan mimics the truth. Notice how he does it. God incarnated himself 2,000 years ago in flesh, didn't he? Satan will incarnate himself again in flesh. And the incarnation of Satan in flesh will be the Antichrist, Revelation chapter number 13. First three and one half years, the Antichrist is a man just like you. Not one bit of difference. Not one whit. But when Satan is cast out of heaven, Revelation chapter number 12, when Michael overcomes him and cast him down to the earth, that will coincide with the middle of the tribulation period when the Antichrist has a deadly wound that, is, that takes his life. And he is raised from the dead. And when he comes back to life, he is literally Satan incarnate in flesh. That is a mimic of the true incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only a false Christ, but a false resurrection. That's what you can look forward to. And that's what the world's being prepared for. I'm going to jump forward here just a moment. I want you to hear this now. This is very important because I'm going to run out of time. And I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else. Listen carefully to this. Because infernal evolutionary conceptions reverse and upend the Genesis account ex nihilo, or nihilo, that's Latin for out of nothing. In other words, God created everything from nothing. Their sweeping acceptance means that it is now difficult, if not impossible, for Americans and Westerners to conceive of the Genesis account creation, ex nihilo, as traditional Christianity taught. And they can't. This is because if God has evolved from man, who has evolved from beast, then perfection obviously lies somewhere in the future rather than in the past from which mankind fell, right? As well, if after a big bang, a limited God used evolutionary energy over vast periods of time before the appearance of hominids, then God is responsible for the suffering and death of millions of life forms preceding the hominids, making God the father of death and evil. In this demonically inverted theology, the way to perfection proposed by the devil obviously lies with the occult science of hermetic magic and psychotechnologies. Now watch this. Listen carefully. Whereby man's salvation is achieved by becoming one with the divine substance, omega point, quantum void, Brahman, or singularity. Now, how many of you in here this morning when I said the word singularity had a bell ring? Well, let me ring it for you. You remember when I taught you about CERN? You remember we talked about CERN, this large Hadron Collider? All right. We all understand that there is a public pronouncement and what's really going on. There is what's given for public consumption and then what's really happening. What's really going on in CERN is an attempt to reach that universal life force and make a connection with that spirit or that whatever it is they try to define it. And by doing it, 
make a quantum leap in man's evolution forward where he becomes God. Why does he want to become God? So he wants to become God so he can live forever. He wants to live forever. And to him, for him, for the unbeliever, for the pagan who has rejected the cross and has rejected eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ, the only hope of him living forever is to become God. In other words, as far as he's concerned, this God force, the force that we started with in Daniel 11, 38, this force has always been. And so therefore, they need to plug into this and become that in order to always be. And so that's what they're looking for at CERN. It is eternal life without the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. Sure it would. His message hasn't changed. He just changes the delivery and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, rearranges it for the culture. But it's the same lie. Yeah. Right. And they're silly, they're serious about this. Just as big like that one and and uh, and as powerful. Yes, sir. Well, what you're getting in, absolutely. What you're getting into is the foundation of occult theology. It goes like this. There's a vast difference between the God of the Old Testament and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm talking about what they say, not I say. There's a vast difference between the God of the Old Testament and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a vast difference between what the Lord Jesus Christ taught and what the Apostle Paul taught. Are you following me now? They're telling this, they're, this is the way they dissect the Bible. And by doing this, the first thing they do is cast doubt in your mind to inspiration of Scripture and continuity of the Bible and all that. But they really believe that. And so this is why the first century, first century after Christ, so many Gnostics showed up who said, Oh, yes, I believe the Bible. Uh, I believe the Bible. But you must understand that you need to be spiritually enlightened to really get the message of the Bible that what it literally says is for the folks sitting in the pews but once you really begin to plug into this spirit universal life force then you can understand that there's a much higher message it's called an allegorical interpretation of the Bible see what I mean an allegorical so therefore if the Bible in the Old Testament says that God told the children of Israel to spare not men, women, children, that's rough stuff, isn't it? Well, that's not really what he meant. What he meant was, and then they give their spin on it from the allegorical interpretation. You're following. By doing this, they have made the God of the Old Testament into an entirely different God than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In order to understand all of this, though, you've got to study it in the context of the Scripture. You've got to understand it. You've got to understand it in the context of the Scripture. If you ever get a hold of somebody who denies the Bible outright, refuses to believe in inspiration of Scripture, rejects it outright, 
nine, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be because he's got a problem with the God of the Old Testament. He's got a problem with Paul. He's got a problem with this. He's got a problem with that. And the problem is all in his head. It's not in the Bible. I want the Lord Jesus to do for me what he did for the two on the road to Emmaus. Let him open the scripture and let my heart burn within me when he shows me what the word of God means. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I believe it from cover to cover, God's word. But I've covered some heavy stuff in here this morning. And we're going to get back into it. And I'm going to show you how it grows and how it develops. And it's a springboard. And show you how it, right now in, in contemporary society, what's happening right now before your very eyes. It's an amazing thing. Amen. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. And then we'll meet again next Sunday morning for Sunday school. Brother, will you dismiss us? And that is that on one hand, he's firmly entrenched in his doctrine of evolution. But on the other hand, he cannot specifically refer to what's causing it. What is happening here? Why is this thing evolving into a certain thing? Take a stem cell, for example. A stem cell could become any cell in the body. Once it becomes, any, once it becomes a particular cell, it's called a specified or specific cell, or I forget another term for it. And uh, once it does that, that's where it remains forever. But the stem cell has within its capability becoming anything in the body. This is why there's so much research into stem cells is because they're trying to, uh, to, to create in a laboratory by using stem cells, hearts, muscles, uh, valves, and, and brain tissue and all kinds of things. That's what stem cell research is about. You see out here, you see stem academies, stem, cell, or STEM academies, they call them. Uh, and that's simply a reference to the fact that here we are, we are taking young minds and we are teaching these young minds and we're preparing them so that they can develop uh, into whatever that uh, their gifts are and, and they've been put on this earth to do. That's all fine, well and good. But we need to understand that there is a design going on. There is no way in the world that what's happening around you in this universe that you're part of is an accident. No way. There is a design, and this is where the argument comes in, because when you get into the public school systems, tell them, well, why don't you teach alongside evolution the fact that maybe something designed this? And they'll say, well, immediately you're trying to bring religion into it. You didn't say anything about religion. Simply said design, and design is a fact of life. So this force that we're talking about is a very powerful, all-pervasive thing, but we need to define it and understand it. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Now, you've heard me mention to you about a lady named Linda Kimball. How many remember me telling you about her? This is a very, very, very smart woman. And I've read a lot of her material. And uh, just a few days ago, after I got back from vacation, she had published a new article. And the article was about uh, uh, the hideous, that hideous strength, demonic outpouring, and unconscious Satanism. And I'm going to use a lot of her material this morning because I was amazed as I read through her stuff at how much of what she says agrees exactly with what I've been trying to teach you. It always makes you feel good to know that uh, you're not way out here on a limb by yourself. <laughs> you ever get that feeling? I don't like to be out there by myself. And as I've told you before, if you do not use another man or a woman's brain, it's a good indication you have none of your own. Think on that. And so I'm going to use this lady's God of forces. What does that mean? I had nothing to relate it to. And if you don't have anything to relate something to, then you really don't have a foundation to move from to make sense of it. Uh, for example, if I talk to a first century Christian about um, 
about a jet aircraft, they wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about, right? A telephone or television, something like that. They have no concept of it. They have nothing to relate it to. This is what you're getting into here, the God of forces. Well, when this young lady was with us the other day from New York, who just got saved out of the New Age movement, she said that one of her favorite terms was the force, the force, the force, making reference to a power, spirit power, that is supposed to permeate uh, the spirit world, the force. Now, if you have ever watched Star Wars, uh, I think it's Obi-Wan Jabobi or whatever it is on there. <laughs> Uh, he's associated with a force, right? I've never seen it, but this is what I've been told. The force, may the force be with you. Something like that. All right, this is a reference to some kind of an all-pervasive power or spirit. Now, that's important because I've told you before that the evolutionist is faced with, an, uh, with a dilemma. Knowledge, because she's very good. In, uh, in this area. Now let's start off with what she says. Here I'm going to go down into her article and I'm going to start reading where she says, Hindus call our earth Brahma or God. For they, now I'm quoting, this is a quotation. She, this is not in her agreement. I'll give you the context. She's quoting Robert Mueller. He lived from 1923 to 2010. He was the former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, architect of World Core curriculum, hailed as the UN's prophet of hope in shaping a, quote, global spirituality. Now, digest that for a moment. Global spirituality. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this is one of the movers and shakers behind a one world religion. That's what it tells you right off the bat. All right, we're quoting him. Hindus call our earth Brahma, or God, for they rightly see no difference between our earth and the divine. This ancient sim simple truth is slowly dawning again upon humanity. Its full flowering be the real, great new story of humanity as we are about to enter our cosmic age. Now that's a big deal. We're entering our cosmic age, he says. What was it they sang? The group called Hare, the age of what? Aquarius, the water bearer. The Good to be here and appreciate Brother Valance filling in for me for two weeks in a row. He gave me a little bit of a break and I appreciate that. This morning we're going to launch out into the deep and hopefully have a few things to say that pull some things together because if you are an observant person, if you are observant, then you are obviously concerned about what you see happening around you. And uh, what I'll try to do today is make some connections. And then when we make the connections, it should uh, show you the agenda that's involved in what's happening. Look at the book of Daniel with me this morning, please. Chapter number 11, verse 38. My Father, I pray now, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray for the anointing. Upon what's said, I pray, Father, you'd prepare the hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here in Daniel chapter number 11 and verse 38, in his estate shall, be, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Now, this was written uh, 2,000 about 2,500 years ago, somewhere along in there, 400. And we're looking at something here that uh, even when I was first saved, uh, I thought to myself, now what in the world is this talking about when I first read it?